Hello everybody, welcome to our culture. I'm Scott, joined by Josh. Hello, Scott. And we just came out of Black Panther Wakanda Forever. We only came out of that about 10, 15 minutes ago. It's very fresh. Gathering all the thoughts, a two hours and 40 minute long film that we're going to break down everything in regards to all the biggest spoilers in the movie. So you have been warned um, and we'll just see which different things come up. I do have various things I want to get to because there's some major spoilers in here, um, including some post credit stuff as well. Um, but we'll get there. We'll get there in good time. I want to know what you thought of this film. Dude, it's a big, big movie, isn't it? Like, Ridiculous. There is so much to pass that we're going to get into generally. I thought it was good, but yep. I didn't necessarily love it. There are sections Same. that I do love, but some of it didn't quite come together. Particularly the third act, which is, you know, no stranger to these Black Panther <laughs> movies that they kind of fall to, fall to bits a little bit yep. in the third act, but they get so much of it right, so much of it is cool, so much of it is well shot, mm -hmm. and it is incredibly acted across the board. Like, I think even if you don't necessarily love the movie, there is a lot in there that you will like, and a lot of great stuff. I definitely want to address the Chadwick Boseman side of it because it was that whole idea going in where you know can you make a movie in the MCU this almost factual like approach to this gigantic franchise that we've had for over 10 years now can you do a more heartfelt you know piece about grieving just because of the obviously horrible circumstances that happened over the last few years with not being able to have Chadwick Boseman back for the sequel can you do a genuine movie that feels right that doesn't feel like it's just being made for the sake of it and I think that side of it is actually done incredibly well a lot of just taking all the sound out of the scenes and just eventually towards the end having some scenes and um, some old footage of um, Chadwick Boseman Chadwick Boseman Chadwick Boseman from the original Black Panther and I think that stuff works really really well I was tearing up at the beginning I think that they yes. they largely um, sort of you know they know what you're thinking going in so the movie kind of opens with this scene of um, Shuri trying to save him in, in canon it's the idea that Black Panther has um, you know come down with some sort of illness that they can't define or whatever and she's trying to um, save him and it goes wrong and he passes away and they kind of just go from there um, and they don't really revisit that material on the nose until the very end that idea of like the exact headspace of crying and, and grieving and that kind of thing, even though it does permeate the rest of the film. Um, what do you think of those things and I those expectations? wasn't expecting uh, the opening to give such a gut punch because mm. I, for whatever reason, expected it to take uh, place within the immediate aftermath of T'Challa's death. Uh, but okay. in the moment, in the very first scene, obviously you get the whole sequence, like you said, where Shuri is trying to save her brother just as he is literally dying in another room. Yeah. And that is incredibly heavy because mm. obviously, you know, it's inescapable uh, to separate that scene from the real life tragedy. Mm -hmm. But I just didn't expect it to be that raw straight away. You knew that the movie was going to be about, you know, the absence of T'Challa, mm. the absence of Chadwick Boseman the absence of the Black Panther, but I thought it would have been all uh, in retrospect, so to get that right. scene in the moment, it was uh, incredibly emotional, incredibly yeah. rousing, and I just, I guess it keeps it's emphasizing, wasn't expecting that uh, level of viscerality straight away. No, I think it's it's like props to Ryan Coogler and the, and the entire cast for like, having to walk one hell of a line of going through all this stuff in real life, obviously knowing Chadwick Boseman in real life, and getting on with the guy, and then obviously having the character relationship to T'Challa in context Context and having to try and walk that line of obviously grieving in real life and then the characters grieving or going through those different processes. I think that side of it like lends the film this kind of unique feel where it has an insane amount of weight to it and it has this general fascination around it where it's a very important film to get right. Um, and so that kind of trans um, transitions into, you know, what is this film about? And it's almost intentionally aimless. It almost intentionally steers into what the hell do we do now? And the mm -hmm. rage that can come from grief and the, the reality of having someone taken from you that maybe passes from a disease or something like that. Um, and just having to go, I, I just want to burn the world down. I just, I can't believe this has happened. Um, and then fleshing all that stuff out. So I kind of, I quite like the, I'm going to say that it's intentional aimlessness because yeah. it replicates a lot of their mindsets. And it's only towards the end when um, you get the new Black Panther, when Shuri starts wearing the costume and you get the fight against Namor and you get the big, big dumb Marvel ending and um, where there's an army going up against another army and whatever. But it's the first two thirds or the, the majority of it that I think lands if you're up for um, living in that headspace of, okay, what the hell happens now? We're in this post uh, Black Panther, uh, you know, universe or whatever. Wakanda, they're fleshing all the stuff from the end of the first film. It's like, you know, everyone wants to get their hands on the resources that Wakanda has. I like the idea of just laying that stuff raw yeah. and then taking your time fleshing out the political side of it, the resource side of it. Um, I really like all that stuff. I think it will be a bit divisive. I've already seen some of the reviews, um, you know, given like 7 out of 10 and things like that. And so I think that's maybe where a lot of the divisiveness comes down. The idea that it takes an age to get anywhere, but that's kind of the point. That is, yeah, because I do think that the unifying theme of the entire movie is how people react to grief. You know, mm. you have your central characters who 
who knew T'Challa in the movie who are grieving that character. You have Namor who is grieving his um, mother and what happened to her homeland in the movie. You have mm. all of these characters who are reacting to grief in a different way and how that um, directly affects the plot is fascinating and I thought was emotionally truthful. So yeah. while you don't get like, the scene, the movie isn't littered with um, people like sitting down and talking about what T'Challa meant to them no. specifically uh, in, in that way, in that direct way, but it's about how they react to the character's loss. And I thought there was a definite sense of emotional truth and a thematic through line in how the movie um, sort of interacted with that material. And that was mm. by far the kind of strongest um, narrative thread for mm. me personally. Even if the kind of like superhero dressing of that doesn't quite come together, I thought the core of each character's motivation tied to that kind of response to grief worked really well. Yeah, man, I would back that. I think, like I said, the, the, I can't I can't even imagine what it must be like trying to put this together, um, whether it's from Ryan Coogler's point of view, who, you know, in interviews has said he was ready to quit Hollywood after Boseman passed away, and this was the story that he wanted to go into and realised he could do something, and then obviously the cast coming back and everything else. Um, that whole side of it is, like I said, it's just fascinating, and it's really, really unique, uh, for whether it's for better or worse. Um, we should talk about um, Letitia Wright overall. I feel like, you know, the fact that she kind of had to step into the role, um, again, walking that line between real life and the, the characters um, of Shuri becoming the next Black Panther. It doesn't really happen until right towards the end of the film. Yeah. And they do, they do quite a good um, narrative hand where it's like, okay, now you have all the power of being the Panther. You've taken on this uh, modified version of the uh, the herb, which um, she then kind of just does like, well, I can just burn everything and punch everything and I'm going to go, you know, kill Namor and whatever. Um, I think that's a really good character card to play. Yes. Um, um, what do you think of her overall as the next Panther? Um, yeah, I think it works. You know, mm. right from the start, I think they're positioning Shuri as the next Panther yeah. and kind of, kind of her complicated relationship to that mantle and kind of like I said to her response to grief like mm -hmm. you mentioned there you know initially she just wants to burn everything down and then she is fueled by vengeance later on in the movie because ultimately she gets her mother taken away from her as well yeah. as um, she is killed like halfway through the film mm -hmm. and I thought ultimately like kind of like her conflicted emotions of what kind of person she wants to be versus what kind of person that other people expected her to be mm. uh, kind of like made for an interesting take on the Black Panther character because like they mentioned in the movie mm -hmm. uh, you know T'Challa was was noble almost to a fault yes and Shuri is kind of trying to figure out what kind of protector of Wakanda she's going to be mm -hmm. and you do see that kind of fire in her, eye, in her eyes right until um, the very end yeah I think as well they do a really good thing with this character where you know Shuri is very much reliant on science as the way to move forward she's not really very spiritual she doesn't really yeah. believe that that is anything worth paying attention to she literally tells her mum that the version of T'Challa that she saw in the ancestral plane wasn't real it was just a figment of your imagination it's not worth anything um, and that sort of like you know plays out across the film where it's almost like this whole conversation on a reliance on technology overall I feel like the themes that they're exploring there um, are done very very well and I like the amount that they bring back in for her towards the end and um, where she is able to see her mum again after she's passed away and try and do the right thing um, and spare Namor at the very end 100% I do just think like the performances across the board yeah. are so insanely good like mm. literally everyone you've got like Letitia Wright obviously front and centre you've got Angela Bassett front and centre you've got Denai Guerrero who puts in an ex excellent performance <laughs> as Okoye mm. all the way throughout the movie mm. then you've got obviously Winston Duke as Mbaku, Mbaku. oh Mbaku's so good <laughs> so good so funny yeah. so such a presence in this film and like everyone across the board is sort of like bringing it there's mm. a great sense of range to the movie because it's like I said it's not just it's so big that it's not just about them grieving you mm. know there's there's moments of humor in there there's moments of kind of like joy and hope and happiness and all of that stuff mm. and each actor is so committed to their roles and to this material that you know in certain sequences you can't help but get lost in just their dynamic. You know, there is a great um, section for me mm. where you've got Okoye, you've got Shuri going on like a little reconnaissance like mission. A mission Impossible film. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Like they're teaming up to go find um, Riri Williams. And that we'll entire section, we mm. will get back to. Uh, then for that entire section, like the chemistry between them, the script, the delivery was all so on point mm. that I wasn't entirely won over before then, but once I got to that sequence, I thought, okay, for at least this section, 
this is something special. One thing I do want to flag in that regard is the idea that, you know, you can tell that Kugler was allowed to make the film he wanted to make. There are bits towards the end that feel a bit more studio mandated. Like, again, like that massive battle that happens in the last sort of 20 minutes or so. Feel, it doesn't feel like something that Kugler went, I'm going to return to Hollywood to do this. That feels like something that Marvel just needed to be in there. Um, but for the most part, scenes get to breathe. It's one of the most weirdest things to point out. But if you're watching a film and you can tell it's been studioed to death, yeah. um, it's nice uh, to put a word on it that he was able to put this together and scenes like that where you have both those characters just able to enjoy each other's company and have natural jokes that don't feel like they're breaking tone. It makes sense and um, that they're just having a bit of levity away from Wakanda as they go on this mission. This is kind of like an assumed intimacy mm. there because obviously the characters are incredibly familiar with each other mm -hmm. and it's not just kind of like two talking quip algorithms like, you know, <laughs> sending one-liners back and forth. It feels like the, the comedy works because there's an intimacy behind it, I yeah. think. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's the overall point as well, is that in uh, Chadwick Boseman slash T'Challa's absence, this idea that everyone else who is there, who is Wakanda, has to step up and take on that mantle in various ways, or they need to fill that space in different ways. And I think that stuff is the most fascinating and the most emotionally resonant. Um, and I think they do a good job of, like like I said, we, they open the movie but steering directly into it. Look, he's literally passing away in a different room, and what are we going to do? And they resume that stuff towards the end. But I think one of the best things about the film is that it doesn't hang itself on the idea idea of Bozeman has passed, let's talk about that all the time, let's thread that throughout the entire film. It is in there, but I think so much other stuff happens in regards to the wider world, the wider MCU, and the resource management stuff, all the stuff with Namor and everything else. Um, and even characters like um, Angela Bassett, like, you know, uh, sorry, the uh, actress Angela Bassett, um, she has this incredible monologue which reminded me of Thor um, speaking in Infinity War, and hmm. um, when he just says, like, look, everyone around me has died. And I'm just, I'm just still going. And yes. it's like, you don't really think about it until a character spells that out. But I think that's a really good um, addition to that role overall. Um, we should talk about uh, Namor before we move on to Riri Williams. We should. Um, Namor played by Tanakh Huerta um, as just this really, really cool, like half mutant, half Atlantean um, version of the character. Namor originally debuted back in 1939. Um, and this is a, like, I guess I'm, I'm not that familiar with the source material. No, but I I'm going to assume it's a far more fleshed out version um, than we had in the past. Um, and the, the general approach here is that there is this underground city, which I wrote down, Talokan, um, which exists below the oceans. And they flesh all that stuff out. They'd give like a reason as to why there's a whole bunch of people that live down there and everything that they want. And it's kind of a mirror of Wakanda, the yes. idea of prioritizing your people and going to war to protect your people. Um, I thought his motivations kind of switched on a dime at one point. Yeah. But until then, I think he was, I still overall think he was presented very well. I'm with you. Like, in, in like a lot of MCU villains, like his motivations become quite simplistic in the end. Yeah. He's kind of a little bit frustrated that, you know, the content conflicts couldn't be a little bit more nuanced, but as a presence, as a performance, mm. I do think it works. And, you know, Kugler, the way he shoots the kind of, like, the Namor scenes are so imposing and, like, <laughs> very horror-inspired in a lot of ways. The introduction's like, incredible. <laughs> the introduction of the character and of that entire, you know, like, race mm -hmm. of, uh, like, villains is, like, it's just so well done, so atmospheric, so, like, the music combined with the, uh, kind of, just framing Nemo in silhouette, yeah. it works. It works to sell him as a threat. It is just a shame that once you get into the third act, his motivations do fall to bits and he becomes like <laughs> just a guy who wants you know kind of like world domination essentially yeah. to kill everyone on the surface and you do understand why he's doing it but maybe not to the extent of his bloodlust but even then it kind of just becomes the standard new age Marvel thing of we've got to save him from himself and it's like yeah. that standard card um, but it's done well you know it's it's done convincingly I think they commit to the roles um, well enough I do want to make a point of saying that I think one of the best things about this is the set design is the score is the overall production I feel like the amount of representation on show is just mind blowing. Like, I, I, like to my own detriment, I should know more about African history, and I'm f I feel so compelled to go and r r just even indulge more in the uh, the visuals that are out there and all the various cultural like touchstones that they're pulling from to design um, costumes and the sets and everything else. I just think it's so rich. Yes, That's one of the best things about the 2018 movie, um, and it's back in in abundance here. That's it. There is some dodgy CGI in <laughs> this movie, kind of littered throughout. I didn't notice Thankfully, that much. Nowhere near as much as Black Panther 2018. No and you don't notice or care about it as much because of everything that you just said there. Mm. Like, the actual sets, the actual costumes, the actual visual design of the movie mm. is as incredible as you would expect coming off the first uh, flick, but mm. even more pronounced. Like, just, like I said, one of the be one of my favorite sequences was the moment where they, where they go to America, they go undercover, they do the Mission Impossible uh, <laughs> kind of, like, job, and they have them banded between them, between Shuri and Okoye, mm -hmm. and they're just, like, talking about each other's 
his clothes. And he's like, oh yeah, he looks like the most stylish person in the world yes. with the shades, with the with the drip. It's like it's a good looking movie. It's yes. well shot, and it feels like, especially after a couple of years of Marvel shows coming out mm. and Marvel movies coming out, and rightly getting ridiculed for their washed out colors, their washed out CGI, their mm. kind of slapdash nature. This one feels like it's had a lot of time and a lot of care put into the finer details to visually look like an epic. Yes. Like it does feel like a, it's gonna sound weird to say this, it feels like a movie, it feels like a spectacle, it <laughs> yes. feels like a blockbuster. It doesn't feel as much as designed by an algorithm as a lot of MCU stuff has lately. Yeah, I think alongside that it's worth pointing out that they do have a lot of physical sets. There are some yeah. scenes that are entirely CG, but it's not one of those cases where maybe somewhere like the DC movies or whatever, where you're just going, oh my God, no one is there. No one was there on that day of shooting. It was all green and you filled it in later. And there is a sense of place here that I think uh, you know lets everything come to life in a really nice way. Um, we should talk about Riri Williams, um, whose name I will never speak correctly, but um, I didn't know that she was going to be in this movie. Apparently she was in one of the trailers. Uh, Riri, uh, Riri Riri Williams, don't edit this, Riri Williams, I will just keep saying it until I get it right, is the next Iron Man slash Iron Heart. Um, and it's just in this movie, just they get a whole bunch of references to the original Iron Man, um, where they just recreate certain scenes, there's various things that we associate with, I guess, the Tony Stark version of that character, when the way that he created the first set of armor, and one of the scenes in the Avengers where he chases someone up in the sky, and you just get that thing where Riri can just use her armor and take off and fly around, and there's a little mini Iron Man movie in here. It certainly is, and I don't know how to feel about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to ask you, because on the one hand, Riri Williams as a character, incredible. Like, an Just immediate, uh, like, like announcement of who she is and what she's about. An immediate kind of, like, enjoyment out of her relationship with mm. the Wakandans who come together. She just kind of has a sense of personality and a sense of place that I loved. However, if we're talking about Ironheart, if we're talking about, like, oh, the costumes a bit in the suit doing superhero <laughs> things, I didn't... That, to me, felt like it was from a different movie, yeah, almost. Yeah, and I yeah. do know that there's going to be an Ironheart TV show, which, obviously, this is teasing. Uh, and it feels more... It just kind of felt like one of those things... One of those studio mandates almost, to get, like, an Iron Man suit in here that yes. will sell toys. That's all I could think about when I saw her in the suit, yeah. which sucks because I loved her when she was just allowed to be a character. That was the thing, because, I, like I said, I didn't know she was going to be in here, and so that idea of, you know, they're trying to find someone who has created this machine that can locate um, vibranium, yep. and then eventually it's like, oh, it's like this child prodigy. It's someone who's at a university, and they track it down, and then the name is Ruby Williams, and it's like, oh my god, I know that as the person who's the next Iron Man or whatever. Um, and then, you, like you said, you get those really good scenes where she just gets to be kind of just subtly hanging out with the crew. Like, yeah. she's got a bit of a personality. She's like a child prodigy and everything. And then they just do the scene, the cave scene from the original Iron Man. It's almost shot the same way, uh, where she's uh, activating her armor. And it's like, this is what I made earlier. Um, and I'm just going to go and take these people out in that like really clunky original suit um, that Stark has. It's not the exact same one, but it's shot the same way. Um, and then she gets a full-on suit later in the movie, um, which is the stuff that, like you said, kind of feels studio mandated. It's like, well, we'll let you do the thing that you want to do, Mr. Kugler, but we're going to need you to put <laughs> the big battle in. And yes. I and I Iron Man character slash Ironheart in here. Um, the next massive spoiler um, is that there's a new T'Challa. This comes at the very, very end of the movie. Um, kind of post-credits, kind of mid-credits. Um, but just saying that um, Lupita Nyong'o's character, whose name I forget. I also forget. But T'Challa's uh, partner has had, actually had a child. There's a seven-year gap they mention in the movie at one point, which I remember thinking, that'll mean something, Dark Knight Rises. Can I'm I sure open that back. say a quick anecdote? Yes, I can. love this. When the movie ends, because very early on in the movie, yep. uh, Angela Bassett says to uh, Letitia Wright, uh, obviously their characters, they don't. They don't exist within the world <laughs> of the universe. Uh, they. Uh, she says to her, like, "There's something I need to tell you yep. about T'Challa," yes. and then that never gets followed up. No. So when the movie ended, Scott turned to me and said, "It's kind of weird that they didn't go back to that. <laughs> Why did they just leave that plot thread hanging? Was it a reshoot?" And then immediately you get this uh, <laughs> mid-credit sequence where it was practically an explanation to you, Scott. Yeah, just go, hey, hey, that you. Meant. Hey, they, she was actually talking about the fact that T'Challa had this child, yeah. and that this child is now like seven years old, and she knew about it, it yes. but no one else did. We will flesh that stuff out. We're going to do an ending explain and we'll talk about the future of the MCU, the future of the Black Panther IP, etc. Um, in another video. But tell me, you know, yes. before we get into that stuff in the next video, mm -hmm. just very quickly, what do you think about the MCU's focus on younger heroes right now? Because it's actually mm -hmm. kind of similar to the ending of Thor Love and Thunder, yes, for that movie. True, true. But that in that movie, Thor essentially gets 
a daughter. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've got this younger generation of heroes now. Obviously, they've been teasing, like, a young Avengers-style movie or a show for a long time now. Mm -hmm. And it does feel like they're going whole hog <laughs> down that avenue <laughs> with the introduction of these characters and all of these endings and post credits. I mean, it's cool. I think it's, like, it's the bigger um, hurdle that they have for Marvel overall is superhero fatigue in general. So I kind of wonder if they take some time away and then come back with the Young Avengers or come back with a new ensemble or whatever, whether that would land differently. I don't know how much the average person is sick of superhero hero stuff and um, the fact that Henry Cavill just confirmed he's going to do another Superman and the general response was oh god thank you that's good not yeah. for me but in general um, points to the idea that this stuff's just going to be here for forever like you know the idea of Marvel as a genre or superheroes are just this genre that will just keep going on Yeah. Um, I think it's a worthwhile thing to do but it makes me think of the reality of actors contracts um, and the fact that you know like these characters can live on in video games and comics and with a certain visual like literally it's that person it's that face and mm -hmm. um, that just can't happen in real life and someone like Robert Downey Jr or um, Chris Hemsworth or whoever isn't going to want to play these characters forever so they need to pass it on and then whether that becomes a generational thing every 10 years or 12, 14 years yeah. um, is kind of fascinating but I guess it's all going to be on whether the stories are compelling or not I thought Thor was terrible so I don't know <laughs> what they're going to do next but I'll not be watching it um, so <laughs> I'm curious about that um, but yeah I think that overall the last thing to talk about is the ancestral plane stuff yes. um, when Shuri goes to the ancestral plane towards the end after she's taken the um, they give it a specific name but it's the herb that gives you the black the, powers uh, the heart-shaped herb. The heart-shaped herb, um, which I didn't know what that was for the longest time. I was just like, heart-shaped herb. When was the last time you watched Black Panther, eh? Oh, about, oh God, a while ago, two, three years ago. That did they call it the heart-shaped yeah. herb in that? They certainly did. I was thinking of Resident Evil. Anyway, in that movie, um, in this movie, they go to the ancestral plane. Shuri manages to tap into whatever that ancestral plane energy is. However, she doesn't see her family. She sees Killmonger. Yeah. Um, which uh, allows for Michael B. Jordan to do one of the coolest cameos, where he gets to kind of instill the final third of this movie with the idea of what Killmonger was living for in the original movie, which was why not just wipe out the entire opposition, arm the populace, and uh, create equality through empire or <laughs> whatever. Great um, scene, man. Which is, yeah, which taps into where Shiri's mindset is at in terms of why not just burn everything to the ground yep. and because that's how I'm feeling. I, I only wish that kind of ending was allowed a little bit more room to breathe mm. because that scene feels so pivotal yep. and unfortunately Shuri kind of um, gets over it and kind of you know recons reconciles who she wants to be a little bit too quick. But that's not to take anything from that cameo and that sequence because yeah, he he's comes into the movie and he makes you realize just how good of a villain and how good of a performance mm. like Killmonger was in Black Panther 2018 mm. and having him be there in lieu of her mother or anyone else I thought was a neat little twist and like you said again just kind of reinforces that element of how does this person grieve? What does she want to do in the wake of the death of her brother and mm. her mother? Like, who is she going to be? Is she going to commit to vengeance? Is she going to, quote unquote, get things done, mm. as uh, Killmonger says that she has to? Or is she going to find another way? Is she going to try to find peace? against this army that seemingly is not going to offer peace. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. I like the idea of the ancestral plane shows you what you're, you care about the most in that moment. I think that's quite an interesting evolution of what that is um, because T'Challa obviously was able to see T'Chaka and in this case, um, she can only see vengeance. She can only see fury. Who, who embodies that the most? Uh, Killmonger. And I think that's quite an interesting way for that to go. Um, overall, though, um, closing thoughts. I thought it was epic as hell. <sighs> well, here's the thing. We've talked a lot about the positives right now, but <laughs> there are so negatives in there. It's I so say. long! It is so long, it is strangely <laughs> paced, and like I said, some of the more basic, I would say, MCU storytelling devices don't quite work. Unfortunately, no. the final third isn't as much of a mess as Black Panther 2018, but it still feels so a bit uninspired. Like, the action yeah. sequences, like, they could have done so much more with this underwater threat, but they kind of just, like, put them on a little bit of a boat, <laughs> they have a little bit of a fight, and it's, oh, it's okay. It's not like the worst third act I've ever seen, but the previous, you know, two hours promised a little bit more. The attack on Wakanda itself mm. promised a little bit more. Yep. Uh, so it didn't necessarily fully come together, but it has like you said, mm. to steal a word, epic highs in there. <laughs> and there's a lot, as we probably established in this video, I'm doing mm. a lot with my hands, uh, a lot of really cool stuff to talk about. Yes, I think that's one of those things where it's one of those movies you'll come out of and immediately want to talk about a handful of different plot points because the vast majority of it for the two hours and 40 runtime is just an extrapolation of thematics, whether that be grief, whether that be general responsibility, whether that be power dynamics and global politicking and, and whatever. Those things don't really go beyond surface level other than the grief stuff. So I kind of think that, you know, you just, it's a headspace, it's a Blade Runner. 
whatever. It's something to kind of live in for a, a couple of hours, and then a whole bunch of stuff kicks off towards the end that yeah. feels quite jarring because you're expecting something with more weight I, that never really comes. I do want to say though, man, like the best part of this movie, and this is saying a lot considering how much I love the performances, <laughs> the music, man, yes. like the official soundtrack, whether it's like the actual songs written for it or whether it's the score yep. uh, written for certain scenes, just elevates the material, yeah, brings man. a level of threat, brings a level of hope and joy like I mentioned and it just has such a sonic footprint I know yes. the previous movie did as well but this just feels it makes it feel different it makes it feel big and epic mm. and it just goes a long way to elevating the material I thought even in the worst moments the most MCU-ish like <laughs> bad CGI moments that score coming in framing someone <laughs> in a silhouette just made it feel bigger than it might have uh, otherwise been. Yeah, I think considering that Marvel for the longest time, everyone had that whole conversation of, you know, Marvel, the MCU is so big, but they don't have any audio components that are recognizable. I always push back against that because I love the likes of even the original Captain America's theme and obviously the Avengers music, which is kind of now just the Marvel music and things yeah. like that and they get people going. Um, but yeah, even the fact that certain characters like the Dora Milaje have specific themes that come on whenever they're on screen or maybe they'll herald their arrival because the audio kicks in first. They're really good, effective ways of of giving it more character. And I think it goes alongside all the cultural stuff that I mentioned before in regards to the representation and just showcasing all these various um, cultures and, like I said, touchstones that just need to be shown with this much production behind them. I don't think anything has ever come close to this before. Black Panther 2018. Maybe. It's been close. I feel like this is a much bigger it production. No, you're, you're, you're um, right. But overall, as I take it as a two, I think they're a really good set of movies and there's a whole through line about what you do with power, whether that be in a um, you know jurisdictional sense in regards to looking after a populace or whether that's individual. And, and enacting vengeance and things like that. And even that permeates into what Black Panther did in the likes of Civil War and stuff like that. Um, but yes. We didn't talk about Martin Freeman's Because he's abysmal and he's the worst thing in the <laughs> film, Josh Brown. I hated every single second he was on screen. And I like Martin Freeman. I'm a big fan of Tim in the office. But that dude and the other person who's mm -hmm. his ex-wife. Uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus. Well, not Ju Julia Louis Dreyfus, but Julia Louis Dreyfus's character. Absolutely awful. Just slice that out of the film. I hated it. I was just like, why are we watching this man do just generic Nowhere USA 101. <laughs> I hated that so much. I have nothing else to say. No comment. If I speak, <laughs> I'm in big trouble. Comments are for down in the in the comments themselves. Let us know what you think of Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Ivan Scott from WhatCulture.com. I've been Josh from WhatCulture.com. And we'll catch you next time. Bye bye. Goodbye.